Thanks so much for joining us today, Jill. We appreciate you taking the time to come on our second to last day of Mod TV. And we're really excited to talk about your work. So maybe to kick off our conversation today, can you tell us uh, a little bit about your role at UniSA? Sure thing. Um, uh, as you mentioned, I'm a lecturer. So I teach strategic management and human resource management, but I also do some, uh, some research and I'm particularly interested in research that has an impact. Uh, maybe that's why you called me in on the disruptive um, part of your, your, uh, your program. Um, because the way I think is, I think it's really important that we, have, we do research that has an impact. So I'm interested, as you said, about gender diversity, I'm interested in women on boards, women in executive groups, the gender pay gap, uh, which has a massive impact on women uh, in terms of retiring with half the amount of money that men retire with in, in terms of superannuation. Um, women in their 50s is the biggest new group of homeless people. Um, you know, there's some real real impact and, and things that we should be, should be doing um, to try and, and have a positive impact even in terms of just career satisfaction and, and work-life balance. And that work-life balance actually works for men as well. People forget that um, flexibility is just as important for men um, as it is for women. So that's my research is, is designed to try and, and, and help organisations um, have a positive impact uh, for women in their organisations, which turns around and actually has a positive impact on the organisation itself. Yeah, brilliant. Your, Sorry, go on. That's okay. That's okay. You also mentioned what we're currently doing at the moment, which is my, my current passion, and that's the Small Steps um, program that is actually working. It's almost a grassroots kind of um, program that I've developed with um, my colleague, Carol Kulik. So we work in the Centre for Workplace Excellence at UniSA, and a lot of the research that we do is... Um, targeting organisations at organisational level, you know, the fl flexible workplace practices and, and um, setting salaries, remuneration and so on. So we were really interested in, in the idea of, well, what can individuals do to help create gender-inclusive uh, environments? So what we did is, you know, being researchers, we went to the literature, we went to the evidence, um, but we, we looked across disciplines. So we looked across... Uh, any discipline, as long as it was in an academic environment, because that's where we wanted to start. We we hate the idea that you know we provide organisations with all this all these um, steps to try and improve gender in their organisations if you know our own organisation isn't doing the right thing. Um, so what we wanted to do was have a look at academia, look at the evidence that might show some gender bias for both um, academic staff, but also students and. We've, we've sort of teased out some really clear examples of, of bias that happens in the classroom, uh, it happens in research, it happens uh, as, as managers in an academic context. And that's, that's the one that I'm really excited about at the moment because for each of these pieces of bias or the evidence of bias, we're actually providing individuals, and I mean everyone um, who works, students and, and staff, in an academic environment, we're providing each of them with a small step that they can take to try and address that gender bias. So it's something we can each each do to have a, a positive impact. Mm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And how did you come to find yourself in this field? Where did your interest start? Um, I'm an ex-accountant. So um, I spent most of my working career in the public and private sector as a management and a project accountant. I did a, an MBA, I did a Master's of Public Administration. Um, I just kept seeing, I was quite walking into rooms that were full of, full of men and they were quite competent, but just the women weren't there. And it's like, well, why, why aren't they there? So I just kept getting drawn to gender. Um, and I was just about to look for my third Master's to do and my dad said, no, that's embarrassing, you need to go and do a PhD. <laughs> And um, <laughs> like, thanks, Dad. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whatever. But actually, it was it was a, a great move, and actually ended up as a as a total sea change, total career change. Because I'm now in HR. You know, I don't know how someone goes from accounting to HR, but um, I have a lot of fun with my HR students because I generally look at them and I say, "Okay, who likes numbers?" And they all avoid eye contact. <laughs> HR numbers, and I said to them, "Guys, you've got to get over that because you've got to use numbers and be able to talk to." Talk to people like me who are ex-accountants. So, 
anyway, I don't know how it got there. We talked about tangents and I'm good at tangents. No, I like it. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you've got such a, a wide background there. So what are you currently focusing on? Currently is the small steps um, program. So the small steps initiative, what we did, this is pre-COVID, so towards the end of last year, we actually did a bit of a roadshow around UniSA. We went to the academic boards and we presented this small steps program. So we went through our roles as teachers, our roles as managers and as researchers. We identified some evidence related to the gender bias that we, that we might show. And then we provided a step. Um, and it was really interesting the amount of positive um, feedback that we got. A lot of people just said, look, I haven't really thought about it that way, but, but what you're saying makes a lot of sense. So we might say, for example, um, if you're um, a researcher and you get a CV from a male student and the identical CV from a female student, the research suggests that um, we view a CV from a male um, you know, research student as being more creative and having more scientific value than the exact same CV from a female student. So what that means is that there are, there are fewer opportunities for female students to uh, work as research assistants, um, perhaps even to be mentored by, by more experienced um, staff. So, you know, even at that student level, there's a difference and that just compounds over someone's career. So that's the evidence. And the small step that we recommend is that if you're looking at CVs, that you read them, but then you put them aside for a while, you bring them back and you, you flip it. If the gender was the other way around, would I have come to the same conclusion? So you're actually actively thinking about, um, you know, how you would how you would view that particular CV if um, if it was the other way around, if the gender was different. Mm. Yeah, because I've definitely found it in my career. I have heard even even. Um, female bosses say, you know, oh, we don't want to hire a woman, a woman in their early 30s because they're going to go and have a baby or, you know, everything like that. So it's definitely, yeah, some people don't ever come across that. But as a woman, I guess you're, you're even more sensitive to yeah. a variety yeah. of reasons you can be discriminated against. And that's a really interesting example. So there's sort of two points to that. One is women hold as much bias as men against other women. So that's, that's a really interesting point. Um, but the other, other point there um, that you raise is, okay, you didn't get hired, but you have no idea why you didn't get hired. It's really subtle. Overt sexism or, or gender discrimination is really easy to deal with. Um, if someone says something to you, then it's overt, it's obvious. Oh, we don't hire women for that role. That can be dealt with. But when it's subtle and you can't see it, that's, that's the real challenge, um, which is, you know, that example exactly. Mm. And it's it's interesting when you see examples of how uh, a system that claims to be merit based can be broken apart really easily. And one of the examples that I've come across, um, I'm, I have a background in music, and the classic example you probably know is that orchestras for so long were dominated by uh, male performers, and then one orchestra, I can't remember which one, I think it was maybe a German orchestra, did this thing about okay, we're going to do a blind audition, so we're not the panel is not going to see the performer. And surprise, surprise, it brought the the gender um, allocate. Like, well, it was nearly a 50-50 split when they re-auditioned the orchestra and didn't see the performer. It was yeah. just as simple as that. <laughs> you know, a really interesting one of those, though, there was one, one orchestra that did that and it didn't change anything. And what happened was the women were wearing high heels. I have heard were, of this, yeah. Were sending messages maybe up subconsciously so even even there, they were trying to do the right thing, and it wasn't wasn't solving the issue. So yeah, that was it was a really subtle kind of kind of thing, which yeah, yeah. I, thought, I thought it was fascinating. They were still trying to work out why it was that the things weren't weren't changing. Um, yeah, I want to get to a point, point of merit because I, I I love discussing merit um, because this is of, often people in organisations will say, well, we get the best person for the job, and my question is, well, how do you describe that person? And organisational structures are gendered. So if we think about, because I, I often look at um, women in executive groups or on boards, and the kinds of people that we imagine in those roles, and one thing actually I do with my students is I say really quick, my, uh, 
a CEO of a large company. And I'll say, what did you just picture? And, you know, they immediately generally will say to me, oh, you know, a tall white man. And that's an unconscious bias. So what happens is that feeds into this idea of merit. So the, the person that should be a CEO is someone who really lives for the company. They're available 24-7. Um, you know, this is their life. And this, this is what we call an ideal worker um, idea. So how we, how we prescribe what an ideal worker looks like for that particular role, CEO or any executive role or senior management role, that doesn't fit with work-life balance. And it precludes women and it precludes, um, you know, perceptions that women uh, should be in these roles. So we need to revisit this idea of merit um, because it just doesn't have to be that way. I've, I've interviewed women um, who are executives and have worked very well remotely. Um, one of them said to me that she leaves work every day at three o'clock so she can pick up the kids and she generally takes them to like, you know, it could be sports practice, she gets her iPad out and she's very productive. It's just in a different way. Mm. You know, so. Yeah, and I, I'm sure this next question might have a lot of answers. I'm sure you come up against lots of challenging aspects in your work, but what do you think are the most challenging things that you face in your research? One of the biggest challenges, I think, is people thinking there isn't a problem. So there's no issue, mm -hmm. despite the data. Um, I did an interview once where we, I was with someone who was um, CEO of a superannuation company and, and she was talking about um, this increase in homelessness in women in their 50s. And um, someone tweeted in and basically said, oh, you guys have to get over yourselves, you know, this is just, you're just making it up. And it's like, we're not, we're really not. Um, so even in the face of data, um, good data, the belief that there is no, no issue or that somehow it's going to solve itself or somehow it's the fault of the women. Um, you know, they're not as educated, which is not true. They're not as ambitious. That is also not true um, and so on. You know, people might say to me, oh, but if women want to be board members, they can be. And I'm saying, well, okay, so you're telling me that, you know, if a company like BHP has, say, 10 board members, I don't know how many they have, but suppose they have 10 board members, that there aren't 10 or at least five suitably qualified women who actually want that role. Is that what you're trying to tell me? And then they sort of go, hmm, okay. So it's not a competence question. Um, it's not a, you know, an ambition question. There's something structural happening that is creating a barrier for women, um, you know, to, to have these careers that, lead to, you know, sort of a life satisfaction, lead to financial security and so on that, you know, that men men have. Mm. And in terms of other sorts of complications, are, are there anything, is there anything that you didn't think would kind of be complicated, like surprises that have come up along the way um, through your research? Um Things that I didn't think would be complicated. Yeah, I guess um, surprises is what I'm is what I'm really one, looking for. One thing that I well, when we've done the small steps program, one thing that surprised us, which we're now sort of taking on board, is we often get someone in the audience who says, um, "I've kind of known that, but until you actually said it and then told me the evidence, um, I didn't kind of believe it." But now that I do and now that you've given me a step, um, I'm really happy about that. So it showed us that even having the conversation is important um, despite, you know, when we're not sort of there just saying, hey, you must do these things. It's more there's a real openness and willingness and, and people just are sort of crying out for what is it that I can do in my own work workplace to try and improve things. And I think that's, that's really reassuring. Um, and for the most part, you know, we've had really, really positive feedback, um, which has, you know, mm. been very, been very comforting and, and in some, not sort of surprising. I was, I was hopeful, um, and this goes across, you know, different levels in the organisation, like at UNESA, men and women, different ages, and, and so on. People are really happy to have something constructive that they can do to try and improve. Um, sort of gender inclusivity in their local workplace and, mm. and that's cool. That's really it's really 
uh, motivating to hear, I guess, is that it gives us reasons to be optimistic. And what would you say is the most interesting aspect of the work you do? I'm very much into creating um, bridges between academia and industry. Um, and I think I actually used to blog. I used to blog. Um, uh, this is back in about 2014, so it was a while ago. Um, but I used to blog for the Centre for Workplace Excellence, where I'm located, for their LinkedIn page. And I'd grab uh, academic articles and essentially turn, you know, what might be a 40-page article into an 800-word blog that's written for HR practitioners, so losing all of the jargon and so on. And I found that very satisfying because um, it's trying to build that that bridge. And I try to do that in the classroom as well, you know, giving practical examples, trying to um, have these conversations with students around gender, um, around things that they can do. Um, one thing, you know, as you say to, to students is that, you know, if you've, if you've got people applying for a role, because these are generally students that are going to end up being HR managers. If you've got a role that comes up, make sure you have a diverse applicant pool. And if you don't have a diverse applicant pool, then you consider that you've done something wrong. You haven't spread the web wide enough. If you've got a search firm, then make sure that part of their requirements are to include, um, you know, diverse representation in your in your in, in the applicant pool. So obviously, you know, I've, I focus on on gender, but you know, different researchers will focus on different demographics. So make sure that your your um your pool is diverse. And one of the pieces of evidence that we actually share with our audiences is that if you have a, an applicant pool that has one or zero, well obviously zero, but if it has only one woman in that applicant pool, then the chances of her actually being hired um, are almost zero because she's seen as different. Everyone else is male, she's seen as different. But as soon as you hit two or more, um, that changes. Gender's actually out of there. She competes or they, the, the women compete on merit as opposed to on gender. Um, so that's that's a, a pretty simple change that um, I've actually spoken to executives about, and they go, "We can do that." And I've had I, I had one interview with a with a CEO, and she was actually sent. She was asked to, to vet a um, a list of people for a procurement board, and they were all male. There was like fifteen, and they were all male. So she sent it back, and she said, "This isn't a diverse group. I want a diverse group." And it came back to her and said, "We don't have any women." And she sent it back and she said, you need women, um, you haven't looked properly. And during that time, she actually made a phone call to a friend of hers and she said, okay, give me some names. And within 10 minutes, they had 10 names and she sent them, them back. Um, it can be done. It absolutely can be done if the will is there. I suspect I've gone on a big tangent. No, <laughs> no. It, it's interesting, you know, talking about the will being there because, I mean, as a woman, it's almost like you're constantly justifying your existence um, and it sounds like you're constantly justifying your research. You know, the numbers are there, but people have to take it in. Like it's not a conspiracy. There, There is no alternative motive. Like the, the motive is there. It's very clear. And, yeah, there is a difference between justifying and education. So it sounds like your, your work on educating people are starting to make a real difference in workplaces. Yeah, and I think there is a tendency to think that women in these senior roles just need to be extraordinary women, um, just just to be considered ordinary. And I remember, and I, I don't know who said it, um, so I won't, I won't say who I think said it, um, but there was a comment, um, I'll see if I can get it right, it's talking about boards, saying that we will have achieved true equality when we are happy with boards that are full of mediocre women. <laughs> Because at the moment, all we expect, we, we only accept extraordinary women. Yep, absolutely. And absolutely. It, it, actually, I'm glad you mentioned quotas. Um, sorry. Um, I don't know. Go ahead. Interesting research <laughs> coming out of Norway. I, I do this in class as well. It's okay. Um, there's some interesting research in, in Norway that's actually suggesting that because they've, they've introduced quotas 40%, if you want to be listed on their securities exchange, you must have 40% female representation um, and 
they've actually found that what seems to be happening is the, the good men are still there, but some of those mediocre men that might have been there, um, and this comes back to, Jacob, your current comment about um, merit, um, that might have been there through connections, not necessarily because they were the, actually the best people for the job, um, they're being replaced by competent women. So, we, and, and Norway has actually achieved their 40% um, quota um, and it hasn't destroyed their economy despite what, you know, the, the doom bloomers might have suggested. Um, but it's, it's just meant that, you know, you've got stronger boards as a result. And um, I would actually like to see quotas here. I'm, if you'd asked me that 10 years ago, I would have said no. But I, I generally say to, to students now, because um, I, I like to have this argument in the classroom, give me another suggestion. I, I, until you can, you know, how else can you do it? I'd, I'd love you to be able to suggest something else. Um, I, I just can't. I don't know what it is. It's the only, only one I can think of. Yeah, because if you're if you're not represented, how can someone who's on a board who's, you know, a 60-year-old white male, how can they advocate for me if I'm not being represented in that group? Correct. Yeah. So, yeah, unless there is a quota system. Yeah, like you said, I, there's nothing because even I've struggled to come to terms with like, okay, is this going to be tokenistic? You know, you'll have your token woman your token person of color you know um but yeah is does any are there any other paths forward that are put up besides the quota route i think the quota not that i'm aware of i think the quota route works as long as you credentialize the women that you're appointing make it absolutely clear that you know maybe you're filling a quota but that does not mean that that woman is not competent and that's important. Um, the research, again, this is another one of our small steps. If I stand in front of the classroom and a man stands in front of the classroom, um, the students are more likely to think that he's the professor and I'm the teacher, teaching assistant. So it's really important that we credentialise um, anyone in the classroom. And that applies uh, on boards as well, or even in executive groups. Any appointments, you can absolutely appoint someone who is competent and it can be a female because no one would argue or should argue that we don't have um, competent women available for executive and board roles. They bring something different to those roles and that's a good thing. They bring different experience. They bring, um, you know, they might bring different forms of business acumen. They might bring different networks. Um, and these, these make boards and executive groups stronger. But it is really important that we credentialise um, these appointees, that we make it very clear what their background is and why they're going to be good for the role so that they don't, don't have that, that impact. Yeah. And if anyone's interested, um, one, one thing that I show um, my students is a photo of, so in the US, a photo of the um, the the elected representatives, I think it was towards the end of last year, if you look at the photo of the Democrats versus the Republicans, it's just really interesting um, the difference. One, one looks like the population and the other one is, is all white. Uh, the Republicans is all white. And it's just really interesting because I put that up for the students and I, I should just say is there a recruitment issue because that's part of that particular course. But it, the, the reaction is usually really interesting because... Anyone who thought that there wasn't an issue looks at that and says, well, clearly there, there is an issue um, because you've got, you know, two political parties that look so different. And, yeah. you know, you can kind of bring that back to Australia a bit as well. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and now we are, I can't believe it, we're already approaching our 4.30 mark. So we'd love to know um, where to from here for you. Uh, what are you going to be looking at in the next little while? Well, we currently involved in the Academy of Management, which is now a virtual meeting. I'm supposed to be in Vancouver at the moment, um, which would be more <laughs> than here, I can tell you. Yeah. Uh, but we're involved in the small steps. So what we've done is I've actually found four researchers, three researchers, sorry, around the world, one from Harvard who was involved in a student-led program, someone from the UK who's involved in networking, and someone from uh, uh, Case Western in the US 
who is involved in a very well-funded STEM program. But we're all looking at ways of improving female representation at universities as students uh, in STEM, but also in academia. Um, so really focusing on that at the moment, looking for commonalities across these programs, the different contexts. Some of them are really well funded, some of them are formal, some are informal, but there's a lot of commonality across these programs. So we're trying to share our ideas, have a conversation um, to try and you know just keep the momentum going. And we've, we've got this fabulous site that we've um, got a lot of engagement. We've got polls on you know what your superhero would look like if you had a magic wand, all these really cool, cool things. Um, and, um, and it seems to be getting a lot of engagement. So, and then if we, if we are allowed to, once we get to the stage that we can start the roadshow again, post COVID, uh, you know, we'll start talking to people again a bit more. Yeah, Amazing. that's brilliant. That's brilliant. And we do have some links to drop in, in the chat, Jill, but if people are interested in finding out more, where would you suggest that we look? I would start with the Centre for Workplace Excellence. So where I'm located, that's at UniSA. So if you go to the UniSA website and look up CWEX, CWEX, um, Centre for Workplace Excellence, you'll find a link there. There's lots of links from there. Um, there's a lot of research that's been done in this space, in um, uh, the, you know, the ageing workforce space as well, trying to engage older workers. Lots of really cool workplace um, research that's been done by the centre. So that's a really good spot. Um, if you're in industry and you're wanting to do a, a, a gender pay audit, which I would suggest you do, uh, the Workplace Gender Equality Agency, which is a government agency, they've got some really good, good tools. There are a lot of places are surprised that they actually have an, uh, a gender, play, gender pay gap. Sometimes they don't realise that, you know, someone comes in, oh, but we gave them an extra $10,000, which is great, but there was still a gap to start with. So trying to address that gap. And you can only do that if you have data. Mm. Yeah, and, and Catalyst actually is another one that's for US organisation, does a lot of gender research. Wonderful. Well, our chat moderator will be peppering those links into the Twitch chat. Now, thank you, Jill. Thanks for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking your time to join us on Mod TV. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Time's thanks, gone quickly. Jill. Oh, yeah. really quick. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks Stuart. so much. Okay. No worries. See ya.